Trashomaniacs. Welcome back to the Geo Gear Hits. This is episode 465 of the almost weekly show about geo look geocaching and geolocation game based games. With me as usual is Chris of the Northwest, and I am Daryl W4. Daryl, so good to talk to you again. And talking might be a challenge for you tonight, it seems. It it certainly is. It it's been another one of those weeks, even though I didn't realize it was. And what really told me that it was, was last night, we had a, a, a project that I'm involved with that I'm not directly responsible for. Well, I guess I am responsible for, but I'm not, you know, a party to the actual, like, you know, work of the project. Uh, it's 10 p.m. my time was the uh, testing and I'm like, okay, I'm just about 7.30. I'm just so tired. I need to take a nap. I woke up at uh, 4 a.m. to see the chats about the, the testing and what failed. Did it work well? Right up until the very last test, everything was working. They found a couple of minor things that were settings changes that they fixed. And, you know, then this was with one of our, you know, bigger vendors. Mm-hmm. And then it was that very last thing. Everything broke. Oh. But they claim that they found it and they want to do another test next Wednesday. So what do you think the chances are that I'm going to stay up for that? Pretty good now. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I slept from 6. It was from 7.30 p.m. till 4 a.m. Woke up, read the chats. And went right back to sleep until six o'clock. <laughs> and I still didn't feel like I got enough sleep. So it's been one of those weeks again. Wow. <sighs> you, you might be a little tired. Yeah. Yeah. I need another four day weekend. Okay. I need one. Well, that's what vacations are for. What are vacations? <laughs> Just sometimes too says Daryl is such a help when he's a snooze when he's in snooze in snooze mode. Hey, isn't that what everyone wants is their boss to be asleep? Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Uh, some days they're wishing. Some days. Yeah. Hey, speaking of a couple of days, a couple you, of days. Yeah. So, sometime between now and when you get your next sleep, there's going to be two more souvenirs available. <laughs> I don't think it quite works that way, but oh, okay. I appreciate the uh, attempt at a segue. <laughs> oh, hey. Um, Geocaching HQ is releasing two year end, a, a year end and a year beginning souvenir as they've done in the last several years. Um, so the last of 2020 and the first of 2021 souvenirs. Now, they're doing something a little different, probably, you know, based on this whole COVID thing. Have you heard of this? I think I've heard of it. Isn't it some kind of beer? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The Corona beer virus. Right. Oh, oh. well, gee, I should be safe because I stay out of bars. Oh, there, there you go. Then you, yeah. that's really pretty much what they're finding out. You stay out of bars, you're safe. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all too true. <laughs> um. So. The last 2020 souvenir you can get for an entire week, starting Christmas Eve, that's December 24th, to December 31st, you'll be able to find any cash type. See, you'll be able to get this. I read those dates differently. I read it uh, Jewel Caching Eve through mm. uh, New Year's Eve. Yeah, that you could do that. Okay. Yeah. So I figured, you know. This is for the uh, folks who are going out jewel caching so that they can get the uh, souvenir and then party like it's, uh, you know, nowhere to party on uh, New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So in the past, you had just December 31st to get that and December 1st to get the first of 2020. Ooh. Oh, we'll, we'll check that out in a minute. Okay. So the first of 2021, you have January 1st through the 8th to go out and find any type. And that includes traditional multi-caches, virtual caches, letterbox hybrids, event caches. Yeah. Like you're going to go to one of those, uh, mystery caches, webcam caches, earth caches, where I go caches. And this year they've added adventure labs, which yeah, I, you know, is, a, is an actual find on your Absolutely, yeah. which makes sense. And this is the year of the adventure labs. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think there's anything but the location list that uh, doesn't show up on that list. Uh, I don't see CETO. Well, that, uh, that's classified as an event, isn't it? It's, I think, I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, and if, if it is getting that specific, then yeah, it's events, megas, and, and gigas don't. Angel G27. Just rubs it in, says we can go to events in Australia. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at this uh, story that uh, I accidentally clicked on a little too early from uh, GSM Times Two, who says that uh, the Hider page on uh, geocaching.com has a new look. So of course I get all excited and have to go check it out. So I have to go check it out. So you yeah, can let's go over here. An event. They have a um oh interesting. It says thank you for hiding, yes, X number of caches in the community. Um mine has a big how to make a favorite worthy favorite point worthy geocache. Oh yours oh, does interesting. Mine, mine's formatted a little different. Yeah, how to hide a geocache. Ready to hide a cache. So it's just basically walking you through the uh, instructions a little bit nicer. And then they now have the instructions for finders. These are those uh, sheets that uh, you can put in the cache mm -hmm. uh, right here. Uh, event, uh, ge or event uh, geocaches host the event with the two guidelines. So... Hmm. I'm not sure I should actually click on the hide uh, a cache to see if that's changed. I, I would assume that's just going to take you. No, it doesn't. Um, no, it, it, you have the same one I do. I thought it would take you a little farther down the page to the hide a cache button. Continue anyway. Yep. Locations. Yeah. You already know your hiding spot. So, yeah, it's very nice. I like the enhancements. Uh, definitely going to be a lot easier for the uh, people uh, just getting started mm. with hiding in cash. So hopefully we'll see a lot of new uh, hides coming soon. Very cool. Yeah, and GSM Times 2 says from that point, it doesn't look like there are uh, uh, any changes. Which is kind of what I expected. This is a cosmetic change that's going to uh, provide better guidance for people who are hiding for the first time. That's, to me, what it looks like. So GSM times two, did you find that because you've, you're out hiding new caches? Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, he doesn't ever hide caches. He's one of those uh, cachers that never puts out any caches. Yeah. He is, he is pretty much just a leech on the community there. Ooh, just finding our way says, darn, I wonder how long uh, it will take before my shortcut to the old form will go away. Oh, interesting. Well, I think, I think he's probably talking about the old uh, hide form. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that is going to go away. This one, at least, uh, the hide page that we were on, uh, oh, no, I saw it on uh, Facebook. Uh, Ian showed it to us. Oh, so Ian's withholding from the uh, Geo Gearheads now. I wonder what I've done to uh, anger you, him. You've offended him somehow. I, I must have. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ian, I'm, I'm sorry for whatever I might have done. Let me know. So, <laughs> um, But no, I, I 
I know that that is going to go away at some point, but I don't know when. I, you know, I never heard a uh, date. Just that it's it was temporarily there, and it will go away. Okay. Oh, interesting. It it's I just went back to the page to uh, make sure to grab the uh, URL for the uh, show mm-hmm. notes, and it jumps back and forth between two different URLs for a moment. Hmm. Uh oh, sorry. Someone found the gift events. Well, I was hoping to a reels get a get a list. Here we go. Uh, yes, so that is our next uh, subject, is that the um, um, GIF uh, reels are available on geocaching, or on uh, YouTube, rather. And the interesting thing is that they went and did, like, a highlight, the best of. Best of, yes. Yeah. So, and can you uh, imagine it's been seven years, Daryl, since the first GIF? You know, I couldn't until I watched that. Mm-hmm. Renee and I had that on in the background as we were working on other things on uh, uh, Thanksgiving Day. And she didn't recognize the first several years because, you know, she's only been caching for about okay. five or six years, something like that. Mm-hmm. So it was a uh, um, nice background, though. The problem that I have with it is that the, you know, with their uh, compilation one is they only show you snippets of the runners up. Mm -hmm. The winners get the full thing in there, but yeah, they only give you the snippets, but it was an hour long video. So it's actually, I think it's over an hour. Uh, Do you have that uh, handy? It is. Oh, it's an hour, 50 minutes. So it's yeah, two hours. two hours. So it is a long, long video, but especially for those of us who, you know, the the first year you had to have been there, mm-hmm. which was uh, a little bit of a problem. Um, but they did eventually release the uh, video. Of, originally, it was released on Vimeo, I think, mm-hmm. which is how mm-hmm. I ended up. Uh, mm-hmm. catching it and then was it that next year in uh, uh, 2014 that they actually uh, started doing the GIF events uh, I, yes yes it wasn't the first year it was the second right. because it got okay. rained out yeah yeah so it's the second year that I actually went to my first GIF event and I I think I've hit a GIF event every year since mm-hmm. and they're always a blast Yes. So I will definitely do it anytime they have them again because it is so much fun. Exactly. Um, and ironically, they didn't plan on doing one this year before any of the uh, pandemic stuff hit because they were going to take the year off for the uh, um, celebration. And I think the plan was they were going to do a best of GIF reel at the uh, event. GSM times two said he hosted a Zoom event to watch it. About 24 people watched it together. Nice. That would be a lot of fun. Especially because um, it's, you know, you've already seen these. So now right. you get to go back and revisit and go, oh, I, I remember I, that. I don't see that geocaching is free. No, I don't think that actually made it into the finalists. It was one of the runners up. It's the one I remember the most, though. <laughs> you know, there were quite a few that I remember that weren't in here. Okay. Some of them made it into the runners up where you caught the little uh, uh, sections, or mm-hmm. the little blurbs, like the uh, geocaching ballerina. Mm hmm. Um, GSM times two also says the first couple of years were not publicly available. So, oh, geocaching is free. Wasn't even a runner up. Yeah. And that's kind of what it's right. 
also watch it on a Zoom gathering. Nice. That would be a lot of fun. I really would. Yeah, so I, I'm really looking forward to uh, another uh, GIF event. I mm-hmm. don't know what they're going to do for 2021, but I kind of hope that they do a geo uh, a GIF event for uh, mm-hmm. 2021. I, uh, it's just going to be kind of interesting because it's supposed to have been the year that they were taking off if they do it. Well, they took off a year. Yeah. But I think people are ready for another one. You know, especially this year, I think would have uh, been a lot more uh, interesting if they had taken it uh, you know, to uh, YouTube and done some of these virtual events. Mm-hmm. All right, let's uh, jump to this topic from uh, uh, I, Angel. From I'm not sure what the numbers are. Angel G27. Oh, G27. Okay. This is actually uh, kind of an interesting one I hadn't heard of. This is great. Are you going to read it or should I? Oh, go ahead and read it. Uh, Enigma the, uh, machine found on the bottom of the ocean. An Enigma encryption device um, used by Nazi Germany in World War II was found at the b- bottom of the ocean. And there's a link to the ABC Australia news. And it's dated to to tomorrow. Them. Well, because it's the future in Australia. Okay. <laughs> Wait, so in the future, they find something from the past. Well, no, they've they've already found it, but they won't tell us about it until tomorrow because they don't want anyone to, like, you know, jump the claim. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That, that makes all the sense in the world. <laughs> what doesn't make sense is that the uh, StreamYard won't let me copy or click nope. on this URL, so I have to go and type it in manually. That's www.abc.net.au slash news slash 2020-12-04 slash enigma dash machine dash cipher dash machine dash found dash Nazi dash Germany dash world dash war dash two slash one two nine five zero three two eight. Now I know if you're driving, you got that. You just, just put me on uh Siri or Google and boom, you'd be at that site. Really? It works that well, huh? Oh yeah. I don't know. Should have tested that. Especially because I'm still typing it in. <laughs> Are you kidding? I read faster than you typed? Yeah, well, part of the problem is I have the keyboard way too far away from me so that it discourages me from typing uh, where you know you hear it on microphone as well. That's the thing. tick. Aha, I found it. Yay. Okay. So that link will be in the show notes, but uh, did you do? It was found in the Baltic Sea. And the uh, article says German divers searching the Baltic Sea for discarded fishing nets have stumbled stumbled upon a rare. Enigma cipher machine used by the Nazi military during the World War II, which they believe was thrown overboard from a scuttled submarine. Interesting. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The Enigma. It's believed to have been destroyed before the Germans sur- surrendered in 1945. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now, the Enigma machines uh, looked like typewriters uh, with a bunch of wheels, and they were encryption decryption machines which were at the heart of uh, uh, the war and that was one of the reasons they felt that uh, Germany was doing so well is because they couldn't crack the codes exactly so there were a lot of attempts to get the uh, Adding machines machines but you had to be very secretive about it so that the Germans didn't know that it was uh, uh, captured they had to think that it was lost because they could change the codes and then you'd be SOL. Right. But yeah, I'm not seeing the number of Enigma machines that are actually known to still exist, but I think it's like five or six. It's not many. Um, and the ones that are out there still work. Yeah. 
They're, yeah, they were amazingly built. Yeah, they were really well built, heavy duty machines, mm-hmm. built for uh, um, you know withstanding uh, submarine conditions. Oh, they were they were terribly more difficult than Route Thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> You know, somewhat more difficult than Route 13. But there are a number of the uh, movies and uh, stuff like that um, focusing on the uh, uh, Enigma machines and how the efforts to capture them. U571 is one that comes to mind. That one I watched over and over again. Mm Mm-hmm. The Enigma machines were no match for Alan Turing, says the Pizza Ninja. Uh, <laughs> and White Coaster says, it's been a while since there's been an update for them. <laughs> well, and that's a beautiful thing. You you only need the security updates. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about the patches for stability or new hardware. No, the operating system hardware. just kept going. Yeah. <laughs> ironclad some would say and you don't have to worry about the random reboots in the middle of your show oh good point so the next geo gearheads will have an enigma machine encrypting so you know if you if you want to go get your own enigma machine i uh instead of typing all that long address in daryl i just typed enig- enigma machine found and uh when i typed found it started it started with enigma machine for sale like ooh, are there well there are some uh, cl- uh clones i believe which would still be an impressive uh, uh toy to have and can you imagine uh, uh trying to do a cash based on the enigma machine yes um you can get an arduino based enigma replica for a thousand dollars. Wow, that's pretty intense. See, I'm just thinking of a uh, mechanical machine. You know, I think they had lights on them too, so it did require power. I think. Okay, so no, it, it did not. In 2019, okay. um, there was one for sale, one of 250 that were thought to exist. And it was for sale for an estimated $100,000. All its metal parts had been restored. Wow. But it would be pretty cool to uh, see one of those in person and actually working. You know, I've seen some of the replicas, I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen any actual Enigma machines because I don't think people would actually put them on display if they had them. So they're just reproductions. But there yeah, we... It was the most valuable thing on a U-boat. Oh, yes. The sailors don't mean anything. Nothing else meant anything. It was all about uh, the Enigma machine. See, yep. that I don't think is one of the later ones that they were actually using and i apologize for the people watching or listening on the uh the audio stream because you can't really see this but it's a very pretty wooden box with a like stenographer keyboard Mm -hmm. and a bunch of wheels and then a bunch of other things that i'm not sure what they are up top but in the movie it looks like they were they looked like they were lights Mm. It looks to me like those discs up top actually fit the keys down below if it were closed. Yes. Yeah, but those discs are interchangeable, and that's how they would change the codes. Mm-hmm. And the, yeah, the, the, the different the three discs up top or the four discs up top are where all the work happened. Right. And it was basically different gearing that, you know, you hit the different uh, things and they would do you know, they were uh, aligned to different characters. Mm-hmm. So it was a very, very impressive uh, technology. Is it somewhat ironic? The man in the picture is wearing a, a Huawei. Um, lanyard. Lanyard. <laughs> you know, since they probably stole the 
information there because you know Huawei does that. <laughs> well, at least allegedly, we can't prove right. it yet. Okay. <laughs> but you know, it's gonna anyway. Online uh, uh, online machines are a bit cheaper for puzzle solving. Yes, they are, and thank goodness for them. Well, and realistically, something like the Enigma machine would be pretty much useless at this point. It could be cracked by your phone probably mm -hmm. in a matter of uh, weeks. Your Pizza Ninja says it's estimated that with Turing and his team cracking the Enigma code, they were able to end the war years earlier than it would have been possible otherwise. Yeah, because with that, we could know the movements of the U-boats, the navies, the soldiers, and uh, yeah, it made a huge difference. And the Germans did not know we had cracked the code. No. Well, and that was key to it. Mm -hmm. You had to make sure that you didn't let on that uh, you knew people were able to crack the codes. And they still did a lot of the uh, misinformation encoded. So it was a hard thing to figure out which uh, mm -hmm. were actual messages and which were not. Now, the Germans were so confident in the Enigma machine, they didn't do a whole lot of it. Right. However, <laughs> the Americans, the British, and pretty much all of the Allied forces knew that the uh, Germans were listening to everything they said. And thus, so, wind talkers. Well, and the one that I liked the best was uh, um, Operation Mincemeat. Oh, Mincemeat was great. That was just amazing. Yeah. Just Should the amount of effort. Yeah. The amount of effort. Mincemeat was a uh, uh, a way to decoy away um, resources for uh, D-Day. And so they actually found a person that had recently passed away, dressed them into military garb, and had them wash up on the correct beach with you know, supposed documents that said where the D-Day landing is coming. All yeah. very <laughs> cleverly engineered. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me a lot of the uh, phishing attacks that you see these days. Yeah, very, very much the same. Yeah. See, we can always tie it back to security. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Operation Mincemeat uh, is a book as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the title of the book. Uh, and an audiobook on Audible that I used to listen to every so often because it was just impressive how much effort goes into mm -hmm. deceiving the uh, enemy and how truly important that can be. Mm -hmm. And the Germans bought it, bought it hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, which they didn't normally do, mm -mm. which is part of why it was so impressive. All right. Uh, something else that is impressive, Daryl. Uh, I think you're talking about the uh, uh, radio observatory. Yes. Yes. I've got that uh, prepped right here. And for the people who, I can't actually say this name well. I've, I keep messing it up. It's Artisibo, I believe. Is that correct? Oh, I was, I would have gone with a hard C, but you, you, that's better. I like okay. Artisibo. Well, I've heard it from a few people who actually know how it's pronounced, so that's that's closer to what uh, mm -hmm. they talk about. Uh, but let me actually shrink the window a little bit here. See, nope, that doesn't help. Okay, so this is the photo in uh, Gizmodo for those on screen or uh, watching live of the uh, radio observatory, and this was uh, uh, famous from things like the GoldenEye movie. Mm -hmm. But it was for many, many years, a very crucial part of our scientific uh, discoveries. It did things like discover uh, pulsars, and I think they did a bunch of work on like black holes. And unfortunately, it was damaged in a storm uh, back in November. Oh, maybe, no, it was back in uh, August, I think. Ah, you've got the uh, just August the image. Photo. Oh, there's yeah. there the view from uh, looking on the side of the dish. You can see the top surface of the dish. You can see underneath the dish and, and um, how it's starting to fall apart. 
Well, that's just the uh, damage, uh, and mm -hmm. this is in Puerto Rico too, uh, but this is just the damage uh, from the August cable collapse. So a primary cable failed, then a secondary cable failed, and now the whole thing is uh, collapsed and the radio dish is no more. That's a shame. It's one of those... Oh, uh, Wet Coaster says there's actually video of it uh, oh. collapsing. Wow. So we'll have to uh, uh, check that out a little later when we're not uh, <laughs> recording live. But it's kind of sad because this is such an iconic, such a uh, uh, important piece of scientific history. But it's struggled for funding because it was extremely expensive to maintain. Mm-hmm. And it's been in operation in some capacity since 1963. Mm -hmm. How many other very specialized scientific structures can you say that have had that kind of life? And it's huge. Yeah. It is enormous. It's a thousand foot radio dish. Uh, Jeannie says his daughter said it was the highlight of her Puerto Rico trip. I can only imagine, and now we're not going to see it anymore. But one of the big things that they'd been doing down there for the last several years is uh, like community outreach kind of stuff. Things where they're getting uh, kids interested in uh, sciences. Mm -hmm. So they had all kinds of uh, projects there. And it sounds like they still plan to uh, continue with that. They'll just have to do the cleanup of the dish itself. And then you know, make it basically safe, but they did lose one of the buildings apparently that they use for those outreach programs in the collapse. So Such very sad. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting looking at those photos because I don't think I've seen many photos of the uh, uh, Arbacino, Ar 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 Arbacino, eh. okay, I'm already having problems with it again, <laughs> with the observatory it's always been those wide shots and it is so cool to see that up close. Yeah. It's, it's just a totally different beast than I had envisioned. Right. You, you know, you knew it had to be modular and you know, but boy, when you look at it like that, um, it's so different. Yeah. The individual pieces and, you know, think about it. Was it, it had to be strong enough to support a man's weight out there to go clean it. Right. Oh yeah, I'm sure it was, but I don't think they did too much cleaning, but I don't know. I seem to remember something about, uh, like water jets used to clean it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a but pressure I, washer, but yeah, but I'm, th I'm thinking that that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because the, uh, water on the dish might, uh, impact its usability. Well, it's going to get rained on. Sure. Sure. But if you're trying to use it, water to wash it. You know, you want to probably, you know, clean it before you use it. And if you have to wait two hours, that might be a problem. But I, I would imagine with a dish that big, the amount of debris that gets on it that would actually impact its usability mm -hmm. isn't likely that big. That's true. Yeah, I can imagine a weather event, water, you know, rain, whatever would impact it. Oh, yeah. You know, covering the entire width of the dish, but. You know, a tree branch here and there probably wouldn't. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, you know, but I, I wonder. There you go, Daryl. Oh, ah, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Arecibo. Uh, Arecibo. That sounds about right. And you know what? If Wet Coaster says it's right, it's right. It's he's the only one that that gave us the phonetics. So of course it's right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> no, it's my, my reading of his phonetics is what I worry about more than anything. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, but yeah, no, I, I would imagine that things like the water would impact the radio signal. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's enough to, um, uh, impact at the point that it makes a difference. You know, it's a thousand foot receiver. And, and this is just the reflector. 
Right. The actual receiver is what's dangling above it. Right. Which has like an entire mobile home on it. So it gives you an idea of how big and heavy that thing was and why it did cause so much trouble when it collapsed. Ooh. But, How to pronounce <laughs> dot com Arecibo. Arecibo. Oh man, that's gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> oh hey, our next story is very similar to this in the fact that um, they launched uh, the fourth GPF three satellite. See how similar it is? It's space based stuff. I was, was gonna say it's space based, space. but this, this is kind of the opposite. They're throwing stuff up in the air and it's not yeah. coming back down. Well, see, it's the, the stuff that came back, back down. down the problem in the previous story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, GPS-3 SV-04, Space Vehicle 04, uh, separated from its upper stage approximately 90 minutes after launch. Engineers and operators at Lockheed Martin's Waterton facility will now begin on-orbit checkout and test, which are estimated to complete in approximately a month. Operation ex is expected to begin in a few months. So yeah, the this, isn't, this isn't that new. This is uh, from November 5th, too. Okay. So, so we're, we're probably right about that time. I just haven't seen any more stories about it yet. Yeah. The GPS-3 uh, SV-04 will join the current GPS constellation comprised of 31 operational space spacecraft. GPS-3, the newest generation of GPS satellites, brings new capabilities to users, including three times greater accuracy and up to eight times improved anti-jamming capabilities. So that means those silly trees aren't going to block you anymore, right? Well, that's not what the jamming is about, but... It seems like it was Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was preserves. Oh, sorry. There were forest preserves that were blocking your signal. Okay. I thought it was more of a marmalade. <laughs> wow. But anyway. Uh, yeah, so we have our fourth uh, satellite up in hopefully within a few more days we'll hear that it's actually uh operational and they'll you know get it into the constellation before too much longer uh we that proved accuracy yeah we still don't have much that will take care of or that will look at uh read that new uh signal though so i think the iphone 12 and a lot of those newer phones do it I know even like the iPhone 11 had some of the uh, uh, appropriate radios, but not for the GPS constellation. They were for uh, um, uh, Baidu and help me out. What's the European one? Galileo. Galileo. So, you know, some of these uh, phones do have the support for the newer signals but I don't know that any of the new handheld GPSs have uh, rolled out support for that because it does require hardware. Excuse me. I don't see anything. I, um, I Google that. Uh, I don't see any cell phones that have GPS three capability. No. Well, I think part of it is it hasn't been certified yet. So I think it has the capability that can be turned on in software is uh, what they were saying, you know, about a year ago. Okay. So we will find out what it is, but at this point, no one's actually going to be able to use it. It's up there. It works. It's going to work like a normal GPSR. You just can't buy the hardware right now that is currently working. And it sounds from what they were talking about, uh, uh, I think it was actually earlier this year, beginning of the year. Uh, it's, they are selling the chips and the radios that can handle it now, but it is not something that is enabled because it's not uh, uh, like certified or whatever yet. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Gary says, uh, jamming is what Daryl had on when he was supposed to be. <laughs> Supposed to be in his uh, meeting, right? Yeah. 
and you weren't in your jam jams? Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and when you're wearing your pajamas, you're actively jamming. Is that how it works? Yeah. See, I had it all wrong. I thought jamming was what you did when you were getting uh, into the music too much. No, that's my jam. That's completely different. I don't know how, though. You know, the things we learn. <laughs> wow. I'm thinking we should probably take off because we're getting way too silly. Well, that and, you know, we've got to go build our own Enigma machine. Yeah, you know, and I'm stuck on my uh, Adventure Lab that I still haven't finished the uh, second one of yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, kind of thinking now, how do I make another Adventure Lab? An enigma wrapped in a riddle. Well, and that's kind of where I'm going. How do I make another Adventure Lab on the Enigma machine? Hmm. I don't think you can really pull it off. How about just a puzzle cache? Yeah, yeah, you get into a puzzle cache and that would be cool. Uh, Pizza Ninja. See, I was trying not to go there. Raspberry Jam? There's only one man that would use Raspberry Jam. Lone Star. All right. Our radar's been jammed, sir. <laughs> I can't do the, uh, the, the mouth sounds like uh, I can't remember his name now. Oh... I, I want to call him High Top, but I think that was his uh, character name in uh, Police Academy. If uh, anyway, if you whoop, if you could pull it off, that would be cool. The jam, yeah, no, the Adventure Lab, mm. and of It'd course, be easier to pull the jam. Off. One who said that, but who was the radar operator? The guy in the eighties that could do the incredible sounds all with his. No. Anyway, yeah, High, High Tower, I think, was his name on. Uh, no, that no, High no, no, that was the other guy. Police Academy. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, the the guy that you're talking about, I think, was in Police Academy as well. He was. He was. And I'm trying to remember his character name, and I kept thinking High Tower, but no, that was the um, taller guy, the basketball player. That yeah, I also that can't think of his name. Huge guy that ripped out the front seats of the car so he could sit in the back, so he had enough room. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, folks. Until you can remember that name, Michael Winslow. That was it. Pizza Ninja wins. Thank you. Our research department to the rescue. Hey, folks, and Pizza Ninja, thank you so much. Check out the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners. So leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cash Maniac shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show's copyright 2020 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved.